Hello everybody, welcome back. The topic we're going to dig into in this session is the major energy system developments that will be required to achieve net zero by 2050. And we've got some big numbers to grapple with here. As Chris Stark uh, just said, investment propositions here are going to increase from 10 billion pounds a year to 50 billion pounds a year by 2030. So these are some pretty fundamental changes. And he talked too about much more renewables, much more electrification and hydrogen, not much natural gas. So we're talking about some structural changes as well. And as we've already flagged a couple of times, a shift for some quite a lot of it happening on the distribution networks. That's the topic for this upcoming session. Um, first of all, we'll have a presentation from Hannah Evans, the, from the Carbon Trust. She's absolutely the best person to talk about this. She was the bioenergy strategy lead at the, the Energy Technologies Institute and at the Energy Systems Catapult. And before that, she was working on offshore transmission policy at Ofgem. She'll talk to you for half an hour or so, and then she'll moderate a discussion with our panelists, who are Steve Hargreaves from EDF Energy, Alex Coulton from the Low Carbon Contracts Company, Rebecca Hart from National Grid ESO, and Nathan Wyatt from the National Infrastructure Commission. Don't forget to add your questions as you join the discussion. Hannah, over to you. Hi, Janet. Many thanks for the introduction and good morning to everyone joining us today. Uh, as Janet mentioned, my name is Hannah Evans. I'm a manager within the energy systems team um, and worked with the team here at Carbon Trust and at Imperial College London on the Flexibility in Great Britain report, which we launched yesterday. Today's presentation will look at the findings of the Flexibility in Great Britain report with a particular focus on what it means for meeting the net zero challenge. So in terms of what we'll cover today, I'll provide a short summary of the project background and methodology, and we'll then look at how we approach some of our research questions and what we found out through our modelling analysis and, how, and about how the energy system might look in 2050. Specifically, I'll look at the impact on the energy system, cost and infrastructure of meeting a more stringent carbon target. We'll then go in to look at uh, the focus on flexibility deployed within the energy system in a bit more detail and how those different types of flexibility deliver value. Um, I'll then look a, bit about the, a little bit about the interactions between a flexible energy system and carbon capture and storage, and specifically how flexibility might reduce the need for net negative emissions technologies. And we'll then finish up by looking at what this analysis of the 2050 energy system means for us today, and how we can put what we found into practice. So starting with a bit of project background, the Flexibility in Great Britain project set out to understand the role and value of flexibility in meeting net zero targets. And this builds on the Carbon Trust 2016 analysis on electricity flexibility for bays, which provided a robust evidence base on the value of flexibility in an electricity system looking to meet an 80% emissions reduction target. We've updated and expanded the analysis to cover heat, transport, hydrogen and power in a net zero system to understand the value of flexibility across the energy system and to support the deployment of cost effective forms of flexibility. So as well as looking at the needs of a cost-effective 2050 energy system, we've also considered the requirements that need to be made to, be, to enable flexibility to be commercially viable and deployed at the rate required starting now. And we hope that this report provides direction to the market and to policymakers on the role of flexibility in a cost-effective transition and the challenges that need to be overcome to deliver it. You'll see on the slide that we delivered this project in partnership with Imperial College London um, and supported by a cross-industry partner group who you can see uh, at the bottom of the slide. Um, in addition to support decision making throughout the project, we engage closely with BASE, Ofgem, the Climate Change Committee, National Infrastructure Commission, National Grid and Innovate UK. Um, and we thank them all for their, their input throughout the project. So in terms of the modelling aspect of our analysis, we used Imperial College London's Integrated Whole Energy Systems Model or IWES to explore different scenarios in 2050. So IWAS is a least cost optimization model which looks to meet demand for least cost within certain constraints such as a carbon target or technology deployment limits. So using the IWAS model we looked at three different 2050 futures driven primarily by the heat decarbonisation strategy. So we looked at electric heating which is heat pumps and resistive heating, hydrogen heating for those on the gas, uh, gas network and then also a hybrid heating scenario which is where you would have a heat pump with a backup natural gas boiler. And we chose to define our scenarios by heating pathway as the heat decarbonisation routes are subject to large uncertainty and also have a significant impact on the shape and form of the wider energy system. 
So we took each of these scenarios and we analysed them kind of with and without additional flexibility, so a low flexibility and a high flexibility scenario to help determine the impact of flexibility across key metrics, such as total system cost, energy demand, electricity generation capacity and the emissions profile. Between the low and high flexibility scenarios, we enabled the model to alter the deployment of interconnection, battery storage, thermal storage and demand side response. And that demand side response came from smart appliances, industrial and commercial applications and electric vehicle smart charging and vehicle to grid. Other forms of flexibility inherent in kind of dispatchable generation assets or in the flexible operation of ele electrolyzers was available to the model in both the low and high flexibility scenarios. And we see that being used across all scenarios. In addition to the three core pathways, which we just talked about, um, the report undertakes a range of sensitivity analyses across three scenarios, across the three scenarios, to understand the impact on the wider system of key uncertainties in the 2050 energy system. And these include examining the system cost impact and value of flexibility associated with diversified and dominant hydrogen production pathways, the impact of carbon negative technology availability, which we'll touch on today, the cost and availability of key flexibility technologies, the optimization of system costs for local or national energy system benefits um, and re reducing the carbon target of the energy system from net negative to uh, just zero uh, targets to reflect potential solutions development in currently hard to decarbonize sectors. And we'll also touch on that today uh, as well. Uh, so overall, the modeling analysis highlights the role and value of flexibility alongside these different heating approaches and gives us a greater understanding of the types of flexibility technologies required and how they interact with the heating system to meet demand and with the wider system to reduce overall system cost. So if the modeling helps us understand what a cost effective net zero energy system might look like in 2050, the next part of our analysis board is kind of back to the present day to assess what do we need to do in the next 10 years to kind of get us on, on the trajectory to that 2050 picture and achieve the scale of deployment of each source of flexibility indicated by the model. So working back from the 2050 modeling outputs, we estimated how much flexibility needs to be deployed by 2030 by technology. And then based on those interim deployment goals, we then use 12 indicators, which are shown on the right of this slide, to assess whether Great Britain is on track to deliver different forms of flexibility and the key barriers in our way. The technologies assessed included domestic demand side response, or DSR, from smart appliances, non-domestic DSR, electric vehicle flexibility from smart charging and vehicle to grid, thermal energy storage integrated with district heating schemes and also within buildings, electricity storage and hydrogen electrolyzers. So that was a very brief overview of the project background and methodology, and we'll now move on to look at some of the results. Excuse me. So first, let's look at the impact on the energy system cost and infrastructure of meeting a more stringent carbon target. So in our core scenario modelling, we required the model to meet a carbon target of minus 50 million tonnes of CO2 per year. And this negative carbon target was informed by the Climate Change Committee's analysis of net zero, which found that the energy system will likely need to deliver net negative emissions if the economy as a whole is going to meet the net zero target. And so we wanted to understand what's the additional burden this net negative target was placing on the energy system compared to just meeting a zero emissions target, which is already kind of difficult enough as it is. Um, and what we found was that pushing the energy system to go beyond zero carbon has material cost and infrastructure implications. So going, going to net zero, so the minus 50 million tonnes of CO2 per year target from a zero carbon target for the energy system increases the system cost by four to five billion pounds per year or four to five percent uh, of total system cost under the hydrogen heating scenario, which is the, the scenario we performed this sensitivity analysis on. And that's clear in the chart shown on this, uh, this slide, which shows the annualised system cost in 2050 across four different uh, scenarios, all of which adopt the hydrogen heating pathway, as, as mentioned. So going from left to right, we see the cost of meeting a net negative target with low flexibility, which is indicated by the LF on the x-axis, um, followed by the cost of meeting a, net, a zero carbon target with low flexibility. The two right-hand columns show the same, but with high flexibility deployment. And the arrows between each pair of columns show that moving from a zero carbon target to a net negative carbon target increases the system cost by four to five billion pounds per year, as, as mentioned. And this cost increases predominantly from investment in renewable generation capacity to generate hydrogen. And the, the increase in that renewable generation capacity is indicated by the increase in the light, the bright blue block at the top of each column. However, if you compare the left two columns with the right two columns, you'll see that by adding more flexibility, you reduce the system cost regardless of the target that you're setting the, the, the energy system to deliver on. 
Um, we also found that deploying additional flexibility reduces the difference in makeup between different future energy systems. So if we have a high flexibility um, scenario, we move from a zero to a negative carbon target. Uh, sorry, under a low flexibility scenario, if we move from a zero to a negative carbon target, we'll need an additional 36 gigawatts of generating capacity. But if under a high flexibility scenario, we only need an additional 17 gigawatts of uh, electricity generating capacity. Um, and it's also worth noting that the energy system, uh, energy system deployed carbon capture and storage, including negative emissions technologies under both targets, um, but required less under the, uh, the zero target compared to the net negative targets. So overall, what we kind of took from this, uh, this analysis um, was that, uh, that while it might be most cost effective for the economy as a whole, for the energy system to deliver net negative emissions, there is a material cost that the energy system incurs of meeting that more stringent carbon target. However, flexibility can reduce the cost um, associated with that more stringent target and can reduce the impact of, the, of changing energy system targets if other sectors of the economy can actually decarbonise more cost effectively than we currently think um, they will be able to. So, so moving away from that uh, kind of look at carbon targets and coming back to one of our key findings, I just wanted to kind of show the impact of flexibility on system costs across all three key, uh, all three core heating pathways um, before we move on to the next, uh, the next sensitivity. So this chart again shows the annualised system cost in 2050 and it breaks down that cost into categories indicated by each colour. And moving from left to right, we see the cost reductions achieved under a more flexible energy system for first the hydrogen heating pathway then the electric uh, pathway and then the right two columns of the hybrid heating pathway. And what we see across all of these is the value of flexibility in reducing system cost. Investing in flexibility is a no regrets decision and it's delivering material net savings of between 9.6 and 16.7 billion pounds per year across all the scenarios analysed in 2050. And you can see across all scenarios that a substantial source of those savings is a reduction in investment required in electricity generating capacity and network reinforcement. And it achieves this through shifting demand, and uh, so flexibility achieves this through shifting demand and decoupling supply and demand to reduce peak demand, and also making use of supply side storage and interconnection to help meet demand when renewable output is low. Uh, and then looking at kind of the, the flexibility deployed under each of those core heating pathways, we see all scenarios deploying a portfolio of flexibility technologies across both supply and demand. And what this chart shows is the key flexibility technologies deployed in gigawatts across the high, the high flexibility scenarios for each of the core pathways. So each pair of bars represents a different heating scenario with the left hand bar representing the capacity deployed in the electricity sector, whilst the right hand bar shows the thermal energy storage deployed. It should be noted that the other forms of flexibility such as generation assets and hydrogen and gas storage are not shown here, but are deployed by the model. This was just trying to show the difference between, uh, between the low and high flex, uh, high flex scenarios. So for demand side response and electric vehicle flexibility, the gigawatt figure represented here represents the maximum change in demand over a one hour period seen during the 2050 year model. Um, and for battery storage, it's also worth noting that the batteries deployed here have a four hour duration. So the total energy capacity of battery storage is four times the total power rating. And for thermal energy storage, the, the energy capacity in gigawatt hours is six times the gigawatt figure for district heating level um, thermal energy storage, but one times the gigawatt uh, figure for building level storage. Um, and we can see from this chart that a significant proportion of flexibility across all scenarios is embedded within the operation of heating and transport solutions and appliances. And this flexibility decouples supply of electricity for heating from demand and enables uh, demand for EVs and appliances to be shifted within a day. Um, and we see key similarities between the scenarios, including the use of that significant use of demand side response. We also see significant use of interconnection and thermal storage and district heating. The difference in the deployment of electricity storage between the scenarios is noticeable, um, particularly comparing the electric heating scenario with the other two, um, but reflects the fact that in the electric heating scenario, there isn't really the option of switching heating demand to another vector from such as gas away from electricity. Um, however, we should reiterate that these three heating uh, pathways are kind of looking at the extremes of how we might decarbonize heating, and the reality is likely to be a combination of all three. So in reality, what will the amount of flexibility will need will be somewhere in the range of each of the, uh, the, the deployments we see across the three core pathways. 
So moving on now to look a little bit more at carbon capture and storage, um, we found that carbon negative technologies have a really important role to play in helping to meet the net zero target in 2050. So negative emissions technologies help to offset emissions from other parts of the energy system, as well as meeting the net negative target itself that we've set the, the energy system at minus 50 million tonnes of CO2 per year target. So in our modelling, negative emissions are predominantly delivered by direct air carbon capture and storage, also known as DACs, or gasification of biomass to hydrogen with CCS. Focusing in on DACs, um, we see that it, it being used to offset unabated emissions, so typically from unabated gas boilers in the hydrogen heating scenario, um, sorry, hybrid heating scenario, uh, or gas power plants which run infrequently during times of system stress um, across all three core heating pathways. Um, and what we see is uh, that DAX is optimised over the year to minimise system costs. So you might only see unabated gas emissions being um, emitted on a few days in the year kind of during kind of cold snaps, um, but that the, the DAX will operate kind of over the year to make sure you're, they're offsetting those emissions at the time that is kind of cost optimal for the system. Um, so what we see in the hybrid heating scenario, which is what we're looking at in this, this chart, is the optimi optimization of gas and heat pump operation and more flexibility reduces the requirement for DAX because less unabated gas is used. So what this chart is showing is carbon captured in, in million tons of CO2 per year. And on the left hand side is the carbon captured in the low flexibility hybrid heating scenario. And you can see in the dark blue bar that about a third of all emissions captured are from DAX. But in a more flexible system, so the right hand side, less carbon needs to be captured overall to meet the net negative target. And most of that reduction is due to a reduction in the DAX required because we're using less gas. Um, so this reduction in, uh, in carbon captured and the reduction in DAX um, is significant as not only is it delivering cost savings, as we saw a couple of slides ago, um, but it shows that flexibility reduces reliance on a technology such as DAX, which is currently immature and whose potential rollout is highly uncertain. However, we do still see across all three heating pathways, DAX being deployed to meet the carbon target under both the low and high flexibility scenarios. It's just that more flexibility reduces the amount of DAX we need to use. So a little bit later on, we'll look at what happens if you remove DAX from the energy system completely um, and the value of flexibility in mitigating that, that technology loss. Easy. <laughs> Um, but before we look at that, before we look at uh, the removal of DAX, I just wanted to show how flexibility supports a net zero energy system to cope with dark, windless, uh, cold and windless days in winter. So we're sticking with the hybrid heating scenario. And what this chart shows is the hourly electricity demand over a winter week in the low and high flexibility scenarios. So this week includes a three day cold snap from Wednesday to Friday. Uh, coupled with low renewable generation during that period and that places the electricity system under significant stress and you can see that demand for electricity actually drops during this three-day period across both the low and high flexibility scenarios because we're in the hybrid heating scenario and those, those heating systems switch from the electric heat pumps to the backup gas boilers to take the pressure off the electricity system um, but you can see comparing the uh, the green and blue lines that in the high flexibility uh, scenario which is the green line um, you can see that that demand profile is smoothed over the kind of Wednesday to Friday period um, and actually across the, the whole week and to, to greater or lesser extent. Um, but that is because we see additional demand side flexibility delivering further savings by smoothing that demand profile and shifting that demand within or between days to kind of best meet the supply that is available. Um, and in addition, while it's not visible here, um, in the high flexibility scenario, we do have in additional interconnection capacity deployed, um, which helps meet the remaining demand that, that demand uh, side response can't, uh, can't meet. Um, so all of this really highlights the need for a kind of smart digitalized system, which can help optimize the op operation of different assets, not just within the electricity system, but between both the electricity and gas systems to fully unlock that value of flexibility. Um, and the combination of those, uh, both the kind of gas backup boilers and also the demand side response and interconnection is that it significantly reduces the need for sort of standby backup generation on the electricity system. Um, and you can see that on this slide. Um, it shows that investing in flexibility has a large impact, <coughs> excuse me, large impact on the capacity of backup generation required uh, on the energy system. 
energy system or electricity system rather. Um, so the left hand chart shows the gigawatt capacity of generation by technology in the low flexibility and the high flexibility scenario and we're still with the hybrid heating scenario at this point. Um, and this shows that investing in flexibility reduces the generation capacity required by 17% or 51 gigawatts which is significant um, but we should still note that the 243 gigawatts that you still need in the high flex scenario is still more than double the generating capacity of today's system. So it is still a significant challenge that we're taking Taking on even if we're looking to deploy a high fle highly flexible system. Um, what we see, see on the right hand chart is the difference between those two, uh, between the low and the high flexibility uh, flexibility scenarios um, broken down by technologies. You can see where that minus 51 gigawatts is coming from. And you can see that the majority of that reduction is in gas generation capacity, which has a very low load factor, but is important in providing firm dispatchable power during those times of system stress that we've just talked about. Um, but we do still see that some gas generation is still required in the high flexibility scenario for the same purpose. Um, and that's clear from the the dark grey bar on the uh, high flexibility scenario in the, the right, the left hand chart. Um, as we've talked about a little bit before, I should point out that this scenario is using unabated gas generation and natural gas backup boilers because the model has calculated that it's cheaper to use that small amount of unabated natural gas during the year and offset those emissions through negative emissions technologies than it is to install CCS equipment on gas generation, which has very low load factors, so well below 5% across the scenarios we're looking at. However, we're conscious that kind of the use of gas and the use of unabated gas in particular is a, is a topic of a hot topic of discussion. Um, and I think what we want to kind of highlight in these uh, this analysis is that what we need to provide is that firm dispatchable power that can be relied upon during system periods of system stress so if we don't have negative emissions technologies that can offset those emissions or if unabated fossil fuel plants and boilers are not deployed then alternative forms of reliable power supply or backup heating will be required So moving on now to look um, at the importance of uh, DAX and what happens if you take DAX out of the system um, and kind of linking to the previous slide where we sh so sh showed the importance of that backup generation or backup boilers to provide system resilience um, during extreme events. We wanted to kind of understand the impact that not deploying DAX on the system would have, that not deploying DAX would have on the, the wider energy system. Um, and I should point out that this sensitivity just looked at the removal of DAX, so direct ca carbon capture and storage as a technology. Carbon capture and storage of point source emissions still remained within this scenario, as did biomass to hydrogen with CCS, um, although the deployment of this technology was already limited by biomass feedstock constraints. So we weren't uh, just uh, removing DAX and then delivering additional negative emissions through the use of use of biomass. We were removing the ability to remove uh, uh, emissions from the system. Um, and sessions later this week, um, we'll look at, the, we'll explore the impact of kind of no CCS deployment at all um, on different heating scenarios and the impact that, that flexibility can have on, on minimising the cost impact of that. Um, but for today, we'll just focus on, uh, on direct air capture. Um, so what we found is that flexibility minimises the wider system impact of no DAX deployment. Um, without both DAX and flexibility, system cost increases significantly due to investment in generation, networks and carbon capture at point of source. Um, and this is shown in the charts uh, on the left, which shows the annualised system cost by, uh, by cost category again. So the left hand two bars uh, show the impact of removing DAX under a low flexibility scenario, and the two right hand bars show the same impact under a high flexibility scenario. So under a low flex scenario, removing DAX increases system cost by 22% or £22 billion pounds per year, largely as a result of increased investment in electricity, and electricity generation and networks to meet greater uh, peak heat pump demand as the use of gas boilers within that hybrid heating system has to be minimised to still meet the net negative carbon target. However, in a more flexible system, we see the impact of no DAX is only a 2% system cost uh, increase per year or one and a half billion pounds uh, per year increase. Um, and also, while not shown on this chart, we found that flexibility minimises the difference in el the electricity generation mix between a system with and without DAX. So overall, what we were kind of concluded from this analysis of, uh, of looking at kind of a system with and without DAX is that when you have DAX within a system, you create dependencies on how that heat is delivered within the wider, wider system, particularly under that hybrid heating scenario. You're relying on a negative emissions technology to offset those emissions from the small periods of the year when you are using, uh, using those gas boilers. 
when you see gas uh, DAX being removed from the uh, from the system, then you have to meet a much higher proportion of your heat demand from those heat pumps or resistive heaters and less through the gas boilers. And so without both flexibility and DAX meet, meeting that additional electricity demand while still delivering the net negative carbon target requires significant additional investment in low carbon generation. But flexibility helps to deliver electric heating more cost effectively, significantly reducing the cost and electricity system impact of not deploying DAX. So overall, when looking at how to deliver net zero, we found that net carbon negative technologies have a really important role in helping to meet the net zero target in 2050. But investing in flexibility is a no regrets decision as it delivers material net savings across all scenarios and mitigates the risk of relying on as yet commercially immature technologies such as, such as DAX. Um, as mentioned at the start of the presentation, we used the modelling results for 2050 to estimate how much flexibility needs to be deployed by 2030 and then identify the key barriers that are, that are in our way at the moment. Um, and from this, we concluded, well, concluded a number of things, but I just wanted to pull out four today. Um, firstly, that flexibility should be integrated into enabling infrastructure, including low carbon heat and transport solutions from the start. Um, for technologies such as demand side response, this is about ensuring things like the smart meter rollout do not face additional delays and levering, leveraging this massive infrastructure investment that we've made and the data that it makes available to effectively and securely manage those different devices. Um, we also found that uh, an evolving regulatory environment combined with potentially low financial gains in the long term creates challenges for business model development. So fundamentally, we need market signals to reflect the system level benefit of flexibility that we've seen in the, the previous slides to incentivize the effective deployment and operation of different flexibility technologies, including demand side response and thermal storage. And this will require effective coordination between different energy system players to support the deployment of flexibility, not just for their benefit, but also for the wider system. It will also be important to ensure that, uh, that effective market signals incentivize consideration of flexibility into infrastructure, even if that, that value isn't present in the short term. So kind of linking back to that first point around integrating those options from the start and not waiting until there's a value and then trying to retrofit. Um, however, also for technologies that are tied to sort of broader strategies around heat and transport decarbonisation, um, uh, yeah, we need to make sure that we're sort of building in those, uh, again, building in those options from the from the very beginning. Uh, so thirdly, uh, we saw that a kind of smart and flexible system can only be enabled by digitalization of the energy system. So the value of flexibility is unlocked through real time coordination between assets to operate in sync and deliver that whole system benefit. So, for example, we saw the benefit of ga backup gas boilers um, during times of system stress earlier, alongside that demand side response, which then smoothed the remaining electricity demand profile. And delivering this value effectively across different asset types and also different vectors, so not just thinking about electricity, but also electricity and gas, requires digitalization across the energy system to allow information sharing, monitoring and coordination between assets um, and also between organisations at this scale. And then finally, we need continued efforts for new technology development and innovation focused on cross vector integration. And it's important that we do that now in order to make sure that they're ready in time um, to deploy within a, a system that meets net zero by 2050. So innovation is particularly important to bring technologies such as thermal storage and electrolyzers to the market at the appropriate cost point and technical capability um, uh, ahead of 2030. And also, as you've seen from DAX, it's around understanding the value that DAX can bring to the system to then assess the level of innovation support that that technology requires. Um, but for technologies such as uh, demand side response and EV flexibility, future development um, should focus more on kind of cost effective system integration and an engaging consumer experience. Finally, as you've seen today, innovation and, depl and uh, deployment is not only needed in flexible technologies, but also in other areas of the energy system, such as carbon capture and storage, where progress is needed rapidly if we're up to, to scale up to the levels required in 2050, and also support wider decision making about the energy system. We've seen the links between the deployment of CCS and the, the choice of uh, a heating scenario and we'll, other um, sessions later this week will focus on that in uh, increasing detail. Um, but there is a huge link between the extent to which we can deploy CCS and the decisions we need to make around the, the rest of the energy system and what that looks like. So that brings us towards the end of, uh, of the presentation today. Um, but if you would like to find out more about the results presented and uh, not just today, but in other sessions this week, um, the Flexibility in Great Britain report is now available and covers both the modelling results and the identification of barriers to deployment of flexibility in the energy systems today.
So that brings us uh, to the end uh, almost. Um, I hope you found the results interesting and that they provide food for thought uh, for your own analysis. Um, before we move on to the panel discussion, I just wanted to finally flag uh, some of the other sessions coming up this week. So this afternoon, there's the opportunity to hear from two members of the Flexibility in Great Britain team, uh, Dr. Danny Fajanto from Imperial College London and my colleague Ollie Richards, um, who will both be talking about the role of smart technology in delivering a flexible energy system and the challenges faced in delivering it. And then tomorrow, my colleague Manu Ravishanka will look at the role of networks in supporting the energy transition. And presentations yesterday, from yesterday, which focused on the modelling approach and key findings, will also be available after the conference. So thank you very much uh, again for listening, um, and we'll now move on to the panel discussion. So I think we're moving on. Yep, we can see everyone joining now. Afternoon, everyone, or morning, everyone. Um, so I'm very pleased to be joined today by four excellent panellists to discuss what are the major energy system developments that will be required to achieve net zero by 2050. Um, so before we uh, can kick off, just a reminder to the audience that you can add your own questions uh, in the Q&A section and also uprate other people's questions and we'll try and cover as many of those um, towards the end of the, uh, of the session today. Um, but before we jump into questions, I'd like to give each of our panellists a chance to introduce themselves, uh, starting with Alex Coulton, who's Head of Policy and Insights at the Low Carbon Contracts Company. I'll hand over to you, Alex. Thank you very much, Hannah, and uh, good timekeeping there on your presentation. Um, so I'm very happy to be here to represent the LCCC, or the Carbon Contracts Company. Um, I'll start giving you a quick introduction on the LCCC and then a little bit about why we're here and why I'm interested in the project. Uh, and um, hopefully you've got time to say a few things about myself as well. So the LCCC is a, a government-owned company. We are um, so fully owned by the government, but we're set up as a private company. Uh, uh, as a non-profit private company uh, and we're set up that way to make sure we're operationally independent. Uh, the reason for that is to protect investor confidence in our, our role as counterparty for the contract for different scheme uh, and we're also the settlement agent for the capacity market for the CSB. As I said, we're set up to uh, protect investor confidence in the schemes we manage. We also have a uh, part of our purpose is to minimize cost to consumers. So how do we do these two things? Um, in our day-to-day -day management of the schemes, we uh, uh, make sure our decisions, uh, all the decisions that we make uh, around as a counterparty um, are consistent with the policy intent that sits behind the CFD and the CM. And we also obviously always seeking continuous improvement in our operation and operational efficiencies to try and minimize cost to consumers. However, we also, um, in absence of a sort of credible um, alternative to the schemes that we manage in order to deliver net zero and, and in a secure way, uh, we also try and make sure that the schemes uh, continue to evolve in a manner that's consistent with the system requirements, which is one of the main reasons we're interested in the sort of work that Carbon Trust and Imperial College have been doing here. Um, and um, we also have this kind of drive to, to try and give consumers the biggest bang for their back Buck, sorry, and that means um, we actively look to leverage the expertise that we have uh, in the LCCC, whether that is the data that we have or, or the knowledge that we have that sits here uh, to try and um, uh, give, I said, try and maximize the sort of benefits that consumers can get from the money that, uh, that we get from them. So for an example uh, to that, um, our data analytics team have embraced the uh, data task force recommendations and diligently working to try and increased transparency of the data we hold, uh, and we hold quite a lot of data across both schemes that we manage. Uh, and the evil line amongst you will have noticed that in the government's December publication on carbon capture and storage, we've been named as the preferred counterparty for the uh, uh, DPA, so the power CCUS contract, as well as the industrial CCUS contracts that are currently being developed. And it might not be obvious to a lot of people, but the LCCC staff played a key role in helping uh, government translate their policies into the heads of terms that, have been, that were published at, this, at that time. We also do a lot of other things in terms of supporting uh, government and the development of new schemes. So an example of that is we supported Ofgem ESERV and the government in the development of the settlement systems for the green gas support scheme that, that's recently been launched this, uh, this year. Personally, um, I'm on my second career. So it, I've been 10 years in the construction sector and just about 10 years in the power sector and policy uh, sector. 
I started with Renewable UK, where I was working on the development of the electricity market reform, so the capacity market and the CFT schemes at, at their onset. And uh, I spent some time with RES, Renewable Energy Systems Groups, where I worked on, uh, I guess, influencing the regulatory change and policy change uh, around battery storage. Um, uh, as RES was one of the first sort of uh, main developers of, of grid connected battery storage in the UK, and also worked um, historically with Gorin Strabak's team on, on system integration challenges um, for renewable technologies. At the LTLC, I, as, as Hannah said, I lead the policy and insights team here. We manage the um, relationship with uh, government and the regulator uh, and um, provide us the best possible advice we can in, into that process. What's important to understand here is, um, is that we are not speaking for the government and we do not make policy. So we advise government on, on their, you know, as, as many other uh, organizations in the UK, uh, and um, they obviously make the decision based on the considerations that have a hand, but we will implement the policies that government wants us to do uh, and do so as effectively as possible. So I think that's a quick overview of, of the LCCC and myself, uh, and I'll pass on to back to Hannah. Many thanks, Alex. Um, I'll now introduce uh, Steve Hargreaves, who's Strategy Director at EDF Energy. Over to you, Steve. Thanks, Hannah. Thanks, um, Alex. Um, yeah, so just a little bit on um, um, uh, me and EDF. But, but, but firstly, um, I'd like to congratulate the, um, the Carbon Trust and Imperial College on, the, on this report. Um, yeah, it's always exciting when Carbon Trust and Imperial College get together because it's some of the um, the best modelling uh, we're, we're going to see, and we, we know that this this report doesn't um, doesn't disappoint. And, and yeah, I think it's really important. We're, we're at a, a really important time for policy, and I think it's really important we look at modelling and analysis like this so that we can work out. It doesn't give you the precise answer, but it gives you the the relativity so you can work out what the big stuff is and what the areas to focus are um and and you know so i, th I think it's really important um in terms of myself um yeah i've been in the industry for um 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 well over 30 years now i joined the central electricity generating board if any of you remember that in 1987 um and yeah so it's been very very interesting to see the evolution of the um of the industry um, now, I was expecting a slide to, to, to pop up from for uh, EDF Energy. I, I Is that coming at this point? I think that's visible to the audience. I just ah, okay, think. right, but it's, it's not visible to me. Okay, great, thanks. Yeah, so yeah, if if I think what EDF's um, job is in the UK, um, you know, what, what we see it as, see it as is, is is helping Britain achieve uh, net zero. Certainly not doing it. <laughs> I don't think anybody could claim that because we could, couldn't do all of it. But helping, and if I was to really simplify how we see that, it's it's really um, decarbonising power supply, and then um, in the customer space, electrifying heat, transport, industry, um, and delivering energy efficiency. So, and, and that's pretty much what our business is. So, if if you look at the fan um, that, that that's before you, you know, the left hand side is kind of the first half of that, and the right hand hand side is the second half of that. Um, but in terms of what we're doing, in terms of contributing. Um, to decarbonising power supply, um, we're um, we're the largest operator of, of low carbon generation at the moment in the UK, um, but we're building a lot. So yeah, come 2035, we plan to be operating eight gigawatts of, of nuclear power stations and um, five gigawatts of renewables. If you put that all together, compared to generating the equivalent amount of power um, with gas, that would save. 26 million tonnes, um, so that's a material uh, contribution to helping Britain achieve net zero. Um, and, and, and indeed, we're, we're looking at um, um, you know, further projects beyond that. And, and it's not just that, we're, we're also um, you know, working quite hard on flexibility. So we have the largest battery in the UK at the moment operational, which is working 24 seven on, on um, um, uh, frequency response, um, um, but that's at West Burton B. Um, and then if you look towards the the, the right hand side of our picture um yeah in terms of you know we're the um yeah, a large um supplier of of um to, to b2b and b2c customers and again if you think of, of what needs to happen in that we, we do an awful lot of energy efficiency through our imtech 
um, um, subsidiary, but also in, in our main customers' business, delivering the eco for ourselves and for 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 other people. Um, yeah, we 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 do an awful lot um, in terms of route to market. So we 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 provide wholesale market services to many different renewables projects and, and battery projects. Um, we've got a, a large um, electric vehicle charging company, which is growing every day. So Podpoint, it's got um, uh, getting on for 100,000 um, kind of sockets, um, but growing all the time. Um, and we're also looking very hard at um, our low carbon heat strategy. Of course, the heat strategy is uh, one of the big uh, challenges to be to be solved. But again, you know, lo lo looking at those, there are some big opportunities again to help customers deliver big, big, big carbon savings. Um, and then I suppose the bits across the bottom of the picture is just, you know, it's important to try and do it right. Um, so to try and um, look after the communities that you work in, to um, provide UK jobs, to um, you know, work well with unions, um, real focus on safety, um, safety in our business, um, always thinking about fairness for customers and and, and innovation and, and, and R&D. So again, those, those the, the, the bit about how we do it is also important um, to us, not just not just what we do. Um, so I think that's me. Many thanks, Steve. Um, I'll then now hand over to Becky Hart, who's a strategy manager at National Grid ESO. Over to you, Becky. Hi, thanks, Hannah. Um, so thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, I was asked to talk a little bit about the ESO's view on flexibility and the net zero challenge. So that's sort of what I'm going to cover off a bit. Less about me, more about our sort of general theory on thoughts on things. I thought I'd start with the easy bit first, the net zero challenge. Not that it's that easy, but it's a given, it's non-negotiable. It's part of the framework of our recent Rio 2 business plan, and it's going to be informing all the decisions we as the ESO make over the coming years. It's the backdrop for the range of insights and analysis that the ESO publishes each year. And these explain how we're preparing for net zero, as well as providing information to support decision-making and the rest of industry as well. The ESO has a unique role to play in the electricity system, holding the ultimate accountability for keeping the lights on. From our control room, we monitor system stability and supply and demand, and we take action in real time, as well as use market mechanisms to help us balance the system. Historically, our role was fairly simple. There were a relatively small number of power stations generating electricity for a relatively predictable demand profile. We knew that winter peak demand would be between four and six when people come home from work, school, switch on their TVs, turn on their ovens. We knew that everyone would get up and make a cup of tea at the end of the World Cup final. We could plan for when the power stations would need to be turned up or turned down, deploy pump storage for the demand spikes at the end of the football final. We made sure that supply met demand. In a decarbonised future, illustrated by some of the graphs on the screen, which I hope you can see, and these are taken from our 2020 future energy scenarios, we see all this changing. We see the need for demand to be matching supply, um, while we still, as the ESO, have to ensure a security of that supply. Matching demand to supply is a lot more complex. For starters, the supply profile won't be completely predictable. By 2050, we expect thousands of generators, many small scale, operating at a distribution network level and only producing power when the, electric, uh, when the weather conditions are right. Secondly, the demand profile will be affected by millions of EVs, by heat pumps as well, as well as all the other things that we have on the, on the network today. Peak demand might also be higher today. What if everyone decides to plug in their car when they come home and turn on their heating and cook dinner and watch TV? This part of the net zero challenge, keeping the lights on with high electrical demand and using renewable energy, renewable generation will not be particularly easy. Clearly, this is where flexibility comes in. Earlier this year, we published a report which looked at these new peaks and troughs of the decarbonised energy system. This was part of our Bridging the Gap series, which takes the what we know from the pathways to net zero from our future energy scenarios and identify what needs to be done now. Sort of quite similar to the Carbon Trust looking at 2030 and figuring out what needs to be done now. Um, this report this year looks specifically at what markets, technology and data and digitalisation can do to help make sure that we, as in the energy sector, are able to rise to the net zero challenge. We work really closely with stakeholders to come to the conclusions in the Bridging the Gap report and many of the key messages chime with the results of the Carbon Trust modelling outlined today. The use of data in a digitalised system is fundamental to being able to operate a decarbonised system for us and have the flexibility we need at our disposal. Much of the technology we need is already available, but it needs to be deployed at scale to be effective. Markets can help this happen if they're reformed to incentivise the behaviours we need. The ESO is currently looking at the design of net zero carbon markets for electricity and identifying where change is needed. 
We've also set ourselves the 2025 ambition of being able to operate a zero carbon electricity system. And we're taking action now to meet this target with various different projects. Um, we'll talk about those a bit later. The actions taken towards this target will put us in a good position to be able to operate a system regularly at zero emissions by 2030. And now that's one of the graphs that's on the slide that hopefully you can see is that we see in all of our net zero scenarios by 2035 at the latest, a negative carbon emission factor in the power sector. Finally, we mustn't forget about the consumers and all of this. I think in the energy industry, we're a bit, we have a tendency to think too theoretically sometimes and forget that we're all end consumers. Our families and friends are end consumers. And are we all really ready and willing to adopt some of the changes needed? The Carbon Trust Report highlights consumer engagement as a vital focus area. But I think we also need to leverage technology as much as possible to make it as easy as possible for these end consumers to provide the flexibility we need. And then one final, final point. Um, as a sustainability consultant many years ago, when I used to work on energy strategies for new buildings, we would never start thinking about the technology first. The first thing was always to eliminate as much energy demand as possible. That makes meeting the residual energy demand and managing that energy demand so much easier. This comes back to our housing stock and our buildings. They need to be made more efficient as a no regrets, immediate action, while we're also working at the same time on how to incentivize and provide and source the flexibility we need. Um, so yeah, that's it. The net zero challenge is pretty massive, um, but it's one that the ESO is fully committed to addressing. Brilliant. Many thanks, Becky. Um, and last but not least, I'll hand over to Nathan from the National Infrastructure Commission to give us a quick introduction. Hi, Nathan. Hi, Hannah. Thanks very much. So yeah, I'll just, just provide a couple of minutes on the, the Commission and its sort of views on, on energy and, and a little bit of a focus on, on flexibility as well, given, given the context of today. So yeah, I'm Nathan Wyatt, Senior Policy Advisor at the Commission. Um, and I look after our work on energy policy, so electricity system, future of heat, low carbon fuel infrastructure, etc. So very briefly, what, what does the Commission do? So the Commission was set up back in 2015 by the then Chancellor George Osborne. And the idea is that the Commission provides government with independent and expert advice on the country's long term infrastructure needs. We work across six sectors, so we cover transport, digital and telecoms, solid waste, water and wastewater, flood resilience, and finally energy, which, which sort of sits at the heart of all the other infrastructure sectors. As you would sort of expect from a, from a body like us, we provide recommendations to government on all of these things about what it needs to do to deliver the right infrastructure for the long term. And if you're interested in our recommendations, we've got a host of reports on our website, which are, are readily available. So turning to, to energy, I think since the Commission's inception, it's been really keen to highlight the challenges that the energy system faces and the transition that's required if we're to meet our sort of ambitious climate targets. And most of this is stuff that we're all really familiar with. We know the electricity system needs to rapidly decarbonize. And we know that renewables will do the bulk of the heavy lifting over the next decade or so. We know that our heating systems have to change and that some combination of heat pumps, hydrogen and heat networks are going to do that for us. Um, as we look to some of our harder to decarbonize sectors, we know that we need to develop low carbon fuels such as hydrogen and figure out how to safely and economically transport and store those. And so sort of in this story, I sometimes hear that, that the power sector is the easy part or, or that you know, we've done a great job on power. And, and those, those statements are definitely true, but I don't think that we should mistake the power sector being the easy part of a set of really difficult challenges for decarbonizing the power sector actually being easy. We've done a great job so far, but we've got loads more to do. And if we don't deliver a decarbonized power sector relatively quickly, none of the other stuff is deliverable anyway, because most of it, to a greater or lesser extent, relies on, on electrification. So I think this report from the, the Carbon Trust does a really good job at setting out uh, the important dimensions of one of the things that we still have to figure out how to do on power deliver a low carbon and flexible electricity system. And there's some great analysis in there and, and Hannah put up some of the really good charts uh, in, in the slide pack, although there's, there's many, many fantastic charts in, in, in the whole report. Um, and you know, these looking at a whole range of different things, trade-offs between different flexible technologies, what happens if you consider a more local approach and so on. But I wanted to pull out two key reflections. So the first was that since the Climate Change Committee published its, its carbon budget advice a few months ago, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about 2035 being the date for a, a near zero carbon power sector. And one of the key questions that that throws up is 
how do you do that whilst maintaining security supply throughout that journey? And, and the analysis in this report it clearly highlights that the flexibility has got a massive role to play there. And there's some great charts highlighting how uh, flexibility, as Hannah showed, can help you manage those kind of cold, windless weeks and also how it lowers the amount of backup capacity that you require to, to build out, which is obviously uh, really key too. But my second reflection, and probably the one that strikes me the most, is that the messages from this report are consistent with what a lot of us have been saying for, for a while now. Back in 2016, the, com the Commission pardon me, published a report called Smart Power, which, which looked at uh, flexibility in the electricity system and made the case that we need a step change uh, in order to, to keep costs down and security of supply up. Now, obviously, a, a, a lot has changed in, in, in 2016 and a lot has changed in the energy system since, since 2016. But uh, I think this report does a really good job of setting out that the need for flexibility hasn't. Government's done a lot of great stuff in this space. Industry's delivered a lot of really good stuff in this space as well. And we should, we should celebrate that. We shouldn't downplay it. But, but we need to be clear that we have a, 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 a long, a long uh, way, way to go on this. So those were just my sort of high level reflections on, on the report. And I'm sure we'll get into more of the detail in the conversation. But finally, I just wanted to close by uh, thanking Hannah and others at the Carbon Trust for pulling together what I think is a, is a really good report and uh, giving me the opportunity to discuss it with you today. Thanks, Hannah. Thanks, Nathan. And thanks to you. And thanks to all our panelists for joining us today. It's great to have you on board and really looking forward to kind of discussing a little bit more um, in detail about uh, about kind of the flexibility and the role it plays in, in a, a kind of net zero energy system. Um, so kicking off with our, our first question. Um, so as you have heard from kind of um, presentations yesterday and then today, the report that we've published has focused on flex the the flexibility required to meet uh, carbon targets in 2050 and specifically that economy-wide net zero ta carbon target um, but we already see flexibility playing an important role in system balancing um, and Becky you mentioned that the peaks and troughs work that um, that you've been doing with National Grid um, ESO so I wanted to come to you first to ask kind of how is flexibility already overcoming system challenges? Right thanks yeah well there's there's quite a few sort of different examples I can I can draw on but I thought you know clearly from our perspective we need to just keep the lights on and at the moment there have been some there are all sorts of challenges and we're not the market and the system is not adequately set up it's still a bit too focused on how things have been historically and one of the examples um and we've got this target of this 2025 zero carbon operation and that means not necessarily all year zero carbon but certainly at those moments when there's enough renewable electricity on the system that we can maximize the use of that one quite good example of sort of the challenges that we face at the moment is when we can look back at what happened in the first lockdown last year um, in our operability strategy report if you want to go away and have a look at it we've got a really nice little case study of what happened on one particular day on may the 23rd um, and so i can run through that just a little bit so it explains what happened we had um quite low demand because it was locked down it was also a saturday it was also sunny and it was also pretty windy and this meant that at times the market was offering us in the control room near 100 percent zero carbon electricity certainly it could have been above 90 percent for the entire day however we couldn't operate the system securely enough to um to accommodate all of that we had to reduce the amount of zero carbon generation we had to bring on some gas and some biomass in order to make sure that the system was operating safely securely securely so we had the right level of frequency, we had the right level of inertia, that we didn't have any problems with, with other sort of constraints as well. So that meant that we had to use a product that we've called, that was sort of born out of the times, it's called the Optional Downward Flexibility Management, ODFM. It's not the, the best product that's ever been, but we've managed to reach out to a lot of smaller um, providers, generation providers, who we were able to, who are providing wind and providing solar, and we are able to, make contact with them and then find them find ways for them to reduce their output. These were mainly embedded providers, ones that normally we don't interact much with because we tend to be operating at a transmission level. Um, it's an opt-in service. It's for their small scale generators and they receive payments from us to turn down, but also to turn up as well. So there are times when we might want them to be able to turn up. We managed to get over 170 generators sign up to that. That was over 2.4 gigawatts of capacity. So that's really opened up our ability to contact these people who we don't normally have contact with and help them to help us manage the system. Um, another good example of how we're using flexibility already is our dynamic containment um, uh, service, which has been introduced as well recently. These are really fast response bat batteries and they help us contain changes in frequency. So we need to maintain the frequency between an upper and a lower limit. These providers 
can help us make sure that we stay within those limits by suddenly releasing a burst of, of electricity, of energy onto the system. Renewable generation, because of its intermittency, because how it can sort of go flex up and down in its own output quite a lot, means that it's harder for us to manage that frequency. When it was just a gas-fired or a coal-fired power station, the inertia made sure the frequency was correct. But now with dynamic containment, with this one service that we've got, a flexibility service that helps us maintain the, the right frequency, which is great. So that means we don't have to turn down renewable electricity like we did on that 23rd of May. There are a few other examples. We've run lots of innovation projects. There's a 4D heat project in Scotland where we were connecting electricity, uh, electric heating systems in homes up to surplus renewable electricity from wind farms in Scotland. So that helped us with managing network constraints and not having to turn up turn down or curtail the, the wind output. The important point, as you've alluded to earlier already, is we need to make sure these innovation projects start becoming reality, that they get deployed. It's not just an innovation project, that it moves on to the next step and we use it as much as possible. I think that's probably it for now. I can Thank carry on if you want. <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks, Becky. It's a really interesting case study as well, showing it's not just a case of getting that gigawatt capacity kind of connected to the system. It's also making sure you've got the system uh, kind of services available to, to manage that, that um Kind of renewable generation um, safely and, and effectively. Um, I wanted to kind of ask Steve if you wanted to kind of come in on that question. So it was kind of how is flexibility already overcoming system challenges? Yeah, well, I, I mean, Becky gave a, a great answer, and I think also their introductions, you know, sort of talked an awful lot about. Yeah, flexibility in itself is not a new thing. It's it, it it's it's inherent in any power system because it's the thing which enables you to match um, uh, supply and demand together uh, you know, in, in many different time frames. So, you know, and, uh, you know, certainly when I did my graduate training in the in the 1980s, I was I was in the, the National Grid Control Room in Woking. And, you know, you, you were seeing how all those things that Becky was describing you know, were used to be managed. And, and the big sources of flexibility actually were coal stations and they were very good at doing it. <laughs> you had lots of physical characteristics. So, yeah, the challenge as we close those, um, yeah, is 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 gradually being met by other things. So, um, yeah, gas, of course, is still continuing to do a lot. But as Becky says, it's a real shame to have to constrain gas on when you don't need to. When um, the, the the renewables and the nuclear stations and, and you know, could actually meet meet the the, the, the whole demand. Um, I think I talk a little bit about demand side actually, because again, you know, we we forget that two. market demand side market has actually uh, been open to half hourly settlements and half hourly metering since 1994 you know so our inc sector yeah has you know, has, has faced all these the, the, these sectors and and you know the, the triad contracts i mean they're certainly not perfect but um the, these the, the, that's been pretty consistent since yeah you know, the very beginning of 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 of, of um deregulation in the uk market and 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 have delivered yeah quite a lot so again yeah we should and yeah so so, so demand side yeah let's, let's not underestimate what demand side is doing um i think wind is um showing how it can operate flexibly um you, know, you can trim back um output when it's when it's needed and and, and that's great i think we we'll probably have to find a similar way to to do the same things with with, with solar um, yeah, everybody looks at the the, the duck curves that that, that that show the challenges as more solar comes on the, on the system. Um, interconnection again is providing us with um, great flexibility, and we've grown the amount of interconnection on 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 the system. Um, and of course, batteries. You know, we we we've got a yeah a reasonable um, capacity now of, of of batteries on the on the system. And uh, yeah, I was talking about um, uh, the EDF battery at West Burton B Power Station. Again, it's a fifty megawatt battery. Um, it's working 24-7 just on, on frequency control. Um, but of course, the big challenge we've got is, is yeah, how do we do it without fossil generation? Yeah, how do we yeah, manage um, the peaks and troughs of supply as, 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 as well as um, the, the, the increasing peaks and troughs of, of demand? And that's what, uh, which, which is um, a bit what Nathan was talking about. Um, it's how you do it efficiently on the system when you've got um, a generation mix, which is, is largely fixed cost. So wind, solar, nuclear, um, to a certain extent, CCS is all much higher fixed costs. So, so doing it efficiently is, is is a challenge. And then let's not forget, we're all envisaging a power system that's two or three times the size that we've got today. <laughs> so, yeah, there's no um, shortage of work for us. We'll definitely be busy. 
definitely be busy for, for the foreseeable future. Um, thanks, Steve. I'm going to move on to our next question now and come to Alex first um, for this one. Um, so we saw in the analysis um, presented earlier that flexibility reduces the cost of meeting a given carbon target. So uh, it can reduce that cost you, um, regardless of whether that carbon target is zero or a net negative target. Um, how do you think we can better recognise and value the carbon benefits of flexibility and flexible assets? <sighs> Well, it's a very difficult uh, question, uh, Hannah, uh, and uh, and uh, I think to start with, I think we need to uh, differentiate. I think the uh, the assets, type of flexible assets we've got, and I've got two broad categories in my head, which is you've got your flexible generators, which produce energy or, or don't produce energy to provide flexibility, and for me, that's very very different to uh, what I would describe as system optimization technologies. So technologies like storage, GSR, interconnectors who will de derive value and revenue from the fact that they help in optimize the use of generators as well as network assets on the system. And so you really need to think about these things quite differently. Uh, the, the generation side of things uh, derives value from being paid for, for producing that energy. And that's quite simple uh, and very much linked to carbon pricing and so forth. Whereas the system optimization technologies effectively, uh, because they're deriving value from basically avoiding uh, the use of, of, of extra generation or displacing it in time, it's much harder to explicitly sort of value that. Uh, and I think that's really a really difficult part of, of, of the challenge here. And I think part of the challenge is making sure that the signals in the market and um, the price of generation and so forth do reflect the actual real value of carbon. Now, that becomes really complex, especially when you start thinking about um, the whole system and by the whole system i mean not just the market in, in the power sector uh, but also the interventions that government makes right so the cfd interventions capacity market interventions, and so forth and and one of the real important new things really important in, in our view is making sure that 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 we think about these things together and we've noticed for instance that um you know you can have some strange outcomes or undesirable outcomes if you're not accounting for not just the market, but also how these interventions work. A, a very good example of that, and which is a big conundrum today, is carbon pricing. You know, increasing carbon pricing might provide uh, better signals for flexible uh, sorts of system optimization technologies, but at the same time, it potentially increases revenues for existing incumbent generators, uh, for instance, under the RO, and that's not necessarily good for consumers. So you, you end up in, in this really complex environment, uh, uh, and it's, it's very, very challenging to, to see how you can work through this. I think at the very least, um, a government needs to be make, making sure they they are they are really reflecting the, I guess, social cost of carbon, the real cost of carbon, um, in their assessments of their interventions, to make sure that actually the interventions are consistent with with what what the system needs, rather than, than what the sort of current market signals might might reflect. I, I don't know if that helps, but hopefully that has a bit yeah. of some of the others to respond to. Absolutely, and yeah, as you say, it's a it's a huge challenge, and I think that kind of that consumer lens and ensuring that the consumer is uh, needs a, a, a met at the heart of uh, heart of this, and, and not kind of losing that losing sight of that when we're thinking about kind of carbon pricing mechanisms is is key. And I can see a couple of questions kind of cropping up around uh, around that in the audience uh, Q and A already. Um, I'll come to Nathan uh, next to if you wanted to add any points on that, so around the how we value the carbon benefit of flexible assets. Yeah, thanks, Hannah. I definitely agree with with everything that Alex said there, and I would also start by saying that you know this is a really tricky question, and, and I certainly don't have a, a fantastic answer to it. I think you know part of this is definitely about taking a whole systems approach to policy design, and ensuring that our frameworks are set up to provide the right incentives, and that, that, that technologies can capture as much of the value that they're providing to the whole system as possible. But as Alex mentioned, you know there's there's lots of challenges in doing that, and and one which I think is worth dwelling on is that part of what might be beneficial to, to, to flexible assets is sharpening price signals for them so that they can capture capture more of their, their value. But but the, there's risks to doing that when we, we require significant investment in a large generating plant, like we've all talked about. You know, you need to triple the size of the electricity system or, you know, look at your scenario, you can quadruple wh wh whatever you want. That requires lots of investment, that requires investor confidence. And we've got policy instruments designed, which Alex looks after, which, which do a great job of, of providing the investor confidence and attracting that investment. And if you start to sharpen price signals, you, you might impact that that in in a kind of negative way. So you really need to think 
you know, not just about the electric system, but the whole energy system, but then how it interacts with everything that's plugging in. It's a really complex challenge. One thing which I think is, is, is a kind of positive here is that uh, I think the, the energy white paper uh, published from, from Bayes last year did seem to really be sort of taking seriously that whole systems approach. And I think it'll be really interesting to see what, what, what Bayes, what government does in this space over the, the, the coming uh, months and years. Great, thanks. Thanks, Nathan. Um, from one tricky question to another, um, this time coming to Steve first. Um, so we saw the kind of modelling, the modelling approach that we took in the, the flexibility and GB um, report assumes that the operation of assets can be optimised across a, a whole system, uh, a whole system year and across the entire energy system, so electricity and gas uh, and transport as well. Um, so what are the main barriers, in your opinion, to that kind of cross-vector optimization, and how can data and digital, digitalisation um, play a part in delivering a more cost-effective flexible energy system yeah thanks thanks hannah um yeah that, that, this is quite a big question um i suppose we, we we've had a bit of cross-vector optimization in in already in our markets we with yeah, the electricity and gas markets have, have been very closely interlinked but it's nothing compared with what we need to think about when we start thinking about adding in transport heat hydrogen all those sorts of things um, so whether I've picked out the, the, the main challenges, I've picked out three examples, three specific examples. Um, um, the, 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 the first example is, 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 is one. Um, so what, one, one of the biggest value drivers that the, um, the, the, the report identifies is getting smart electrical um, vehicle charging and V2G. And um, uh, certainly that's absolutely consistent with our own analysis as well as one of the big hitters. Um, so really, really important that we, we, we deliver that. Then you actually think, um, you know, Becky talked about um, the, the, the customers being at the heart of this, and you actually think about customer behaviours in this. And, you know, actually you think how you behave with your mobile phone, you want it charged fully as much as you possibly can. You know, um, yeah, th th there's a big engagement exercise that we need to um, to, 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 to get through to, um, yeah, get people to accept that, you know, we might only... Uh, want to charge their vehicle a third because we know that that'll be certainly enough and you know we know that in two days time it's going to be windy um you know so off we go um but actually getting you know we we, we saw customer behavior um with the toilet rolls during <laughs> during lockdown and um, dare i say it, with with petrol and diesel when we had the um the the, the, the strike yeah, i think it was in 2000 or something like that so there's the, the, there's a there's a big a big challenge there of actually um yeah behaviors and 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 actually Giving customers what you know what they're really truly going to going to want, rather than necessarily what they need. Um, um, a, a second a second challenge, just again thinking of um, yeah the the optimization because I think a, a second very large um, benefit that you had in your in your modelling was just having heat storage. Um, but it, yeah, if you if, if if we want to realise that heat storage, um, it means that we've actually got to get that heat storage into the houses and um you know sort of like having space for that and having you know the building standards and all those sorts of things and you know it, yeah we, I, I know very very closely how um challenging get a customer to, to to buy a heat pump and then then it, you know they wouldn't even think to know about asking about heat storage at the moment the customers aren't going to do going to going to think of that so you know it's um you know that that that's that's uh, yeah another challenge is how you actually get the right stuff in the, in in the fabric of the home and then my third very quick example you know just i guess it's maturity of markets so um yeah we're doing quite a lot of work as we're working up the sizewall c project on the concept of an energy hub where we would um, you know, perhaps use the heat from Sizewell to um, in, improve the efficiency of, of hydrogen production or, um, or of direct air capture. But, you know, when you're trying to actually you know, bring that forward, you know, there's a very mature electricity market. Um, there's not a very mature hydrogen market or a very mature market for, um, um, uh, you know, reducing carbon with negative emissions. Um, so, you know, again, lining all that up together and, and getting that consistent. Again, the, you know, the approach we're taking is just to try and just make it work in a, yeah, you know, in, a, in a small scale, get you know, get research grants, get um, you know, small local um, uses and things like that. But again, it's just that challenge of you know, coinciding maturity of markets. So I've probably said enough. That's great. Thank you, Stevia. And I yeah, completely agree around that, that, that challenge. Regardless of what low carbon heating solution you go to, there's challenges associated with each. And I think that's um, something that's, that's clear in uh, uh, 
clear in a kind of number of reports, and I think is you know, we've, we've kind of tried to highlight in in this this one as well by sort of looking at those three those three extremes and, and picking out kind of the differences between them. Um, and similarly, your point on uh, on market maturity, yeah, we've got uh, it's a very different position for a hydrogen market compared to an electricity market, which is which is well established. Um, I'll come to, to Becky on this question um, as well. And you, you mentioned, Becky, you kind of are now engaging with embedded generators as well as kind of the larger scale generators. So you're um, obviously kind of making those links within the, the electricity system already. But I wondered if you wanted to kind of comment on the role of, of data and digitalization in sort of helping um, the energy system become more flexible. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think data and digitalization is it, it, something we talk about a lot. And I think everyone can recognize it and know that big data is out there and we should be leveraging that as much as possible to help us address all of those very pertinent barriers that Steve's just addressed. Um, you know, we've, we did our analysis and fares looking at the impact of our, our future energy scenarios, look at the impact of vehicle to grid charging, and we can see it making a massive difference in our sort of peak demand scenarios in, in 2050, um, reducing, reducing it to like, an, instead of it being a peak demand, actually being negative because it's putting the electricity back into the grid. We need those kind of things to happen, but in order for it to happen, we need the data to be available, to be used, and we also need digitized systems. We need smart meters and homes. We need people signing up to time of use tariffs as well. The ESO is trying to do our bit by sort of sharing data. We've produced a, a carbon intensity app, which you may or may not have seen, but it can show you exactly at the, whatever time of day, what the carbon intensity of the grid. That's interesting, but it's also useful and it can help start informing these time of use tariffs for consumers. And then hopefully in terms of that sort of consumer barrier, it makes it almost a little bit less something that they need to think about and something that can just happen automatically in the background. Because I agree the consumer barrier is... I shouldn't call it a barrier, but the consumer engagement could be a real barrier to getting the kind of levels of flexibility we need. Um, I'll, I won't go on. I could go on, but I'm aware of the time, so I'll, I'll leave it there. But yeah, there's a lot I think that data and digitalization can do to help. Thank, thanks, Becky. Um, I just want to ask quickly if Nathan or Alex, do you want to come in on that that point at all? I've got I've got nothing to add there, so I'm happy to uh, to move on. Yeah. I just one point, which is, I think it's worth just highlighting the level of complexity that exists in the power sector and the institutional landscape around that. And, and now we're talking about, okay, well, let's look at the system, including the heat and include transport and so forth. And I, I, I really, it doesn't matter how, how much data they're out there. To, so, to some extent, we've got too much data in too many different places. Uh, and, and I really think that there needs to be uh, you know, a, a high degree of uh, as much simplification as possible and coherence in, in everything that we design as possible. And that, that needs to be really fundamental underpinning of how how we approach, uh, you know, the design of a net zero system. Um, you also, I don't, I don't think we're going to manage, uh, if I'm honest. So, yeah. so that's, yeah, just my, my contribution. There. Yeah, drowning in data and, yeah, not being able to kind of see that clear pathway through. Um, so I think, yeah, as, as you all said, you we could talk about that topic in, in detail um, for, for much, much longer. Um, but I wanted to kind of move on to our, our next question, um, which is focusing more on uh, on kind of CCS and, and on DAX. Um, so we saw from the, the presentation earlier that you know, carbon capture and storage was, was part of a cost effective energy system in all of the, the scenarios that we modelled, regardless of the carbon targets. Um, but there is uncertainty around the rate of rollout in the, the UK and and particularly technologies such as such as direct air capture, such as DAX, um, are, are very immature. Um, so coming to Nathan um, on this one first, um, how do you factor in large uncertainties into your kind of near term decision making? Um, and how can flexibility kind of help mitigate some of those risks associated with those decisions? Yeah, thanks, Hannah. I think it's a, a really good question. At the, at the Commission, we're quite a long-term focused organisation. You know, we're thinking sort of 30 years ahead, but we're thinking about what government needs to do now to deliver where we need to be in 30 years. So this is a really, this is something which is definitely top of mind uh, whenever we're thinking about policy problems. So I can answer this from that sort of strategic policy perspective and others might have uh, different views from a slightly nearer term and maybe more operational perspective. So, I mean, you know, in the context that we're talking about this, this is always a challenge because we're talking about uh, investing you know, in capital intensive long life, lot, uh, pardon me, long life assets, which are existing in a, in a pretty interdependent system. And in the backdrop, we've, you know, the, the, the clock is ticking for us to, to meet our carbon targets. And so some of the things that we think about at, at the Commission here are, as you've already had in your presentation, Hannah, sort of low or no regrets actions. What, what can we do now to drive forward progress? Uh, taking an adaptive approach to, to, to policy and, and, and also so taking actions which open up 
potential positive futures rather than close them down. So flexibility is clearly a lower regrets action. It's just lowering costs in all scenarios. What happened, no matter really what you're doing on the generation side, no matter how big your electricity system is to be, no matter whether you've got you know hydrogen for heating, heat pumps or whatever mix, flexibility is, is cutting costs and, and making the system easier to run. So it, it's, it's a sort of no brainer from, from, from that perspective. I think also from considering this sort of adaptive approach, one of the challenges here is, is if you have to invest in big traditional bits of infrastructure, which some flexible assets fall into. So like an interconnector is a kind of traditional large bit of infrastructure. They take a long time to build. Once you started, you're kind of locked into that pathway. But, but like a lot of renewables, a lot of flexible to technologies are pretty small, they're modular, you can build them relatively quickly. And that does leave you from that kind of strategic perspective, much more flexible and able to adapt to, to what's happening in the world and in the energy system over the next 10, 20 years. And then finally, I just returned to the, the slide that, that you had as, as well, Hannah, in, in terms of um, the increasing flexibility minimizes the disruption caused if technologies don't pan out as you want them to. So I think that, that you know, the couple you highlighted was what happens if, if CCS doesn't pan out as we'd hoped, what happens if direct air capture doesn't pan out as we, we'd like it to. And increasing system flexibility helps you handle those suboptimal situations better. And let's be realistic about it. Not everything's going to go the way we want it to. Some technologies are not going to pan out as we hope. Some policy is not going to work as you know the policymakers intended. And the more that we can do to build a kind of resilience to those failures into the system, it, it, it is, is clearly better and, and, and flexibility fits squarely in that bucket as well. Great, thanks, thanks, Nathan. Yeah, and I, yeah, I completely agree. It's that yeah, that value of those yeah, those small modular assets that are kind of relatively uh, easy to build um, helps kind of mitigate the risk of those those bigger strategic decisions. Um, I wanted to bring Becky in on this question as well because obviously National Grid uh, ESA also run their own future energy scenarios and and are kind of grappling with the same questions as as we have been in in this report. So yeah, I just wanted to get your thoughts, Becky, on uh, on sort of yeah how you, how flexibility can kind of help mitigate those risks. Yeah, so, so we've kind of got two sides of it. I've worked predominantly within the sort of FEDS future energy scenario side of it, but obviously we've got our control room where for them, they have these big uncertainties, but their ultimate objective is to make sure they keep the lights on. And so from their perspective, they have to be really risk averse and not do whatever they can to keep the lights on whilst also trying to enable renewables. But clearly, as we've outlined earlier, as we talked about, there are we're doing things with flexibility products and services to try and help us avoid having to resort to, to more carbon fossil based sources of, of electricity. When it comes to fares, um, there are some really large uncertainties as you've had to grapple with as well. We, you know, we might have to make sure that all of our fare scenarios are credible. We feel like there is enough basis for the decisions that we've chosen. We have um, carbon capture and storage though in all of our net zero scenarios and it's really important to, to have it there. But we've also assumed that there will be engagement um, with things like vehicle to grid and that we also assume that customers will be in the main on a time of use tariff. So in leading the way, which is our most consumer engaged scenario, we've got over 80% of people who have a time of use tariff, which to our mind means if they've got a time of use for tariffs, they've got a smart meter, we hope that they will be incentivized to make choices, but also that there's the ability from the energy supplier point of view to sort of look at this in an aggregate and go, okay, we can do a bit of tweaking in terms of the sort of flexibility we need. We could maybe turn the washing machine on now, or maybe we could turn the fridge off for half an hour, or we could turn something down, we can turn something up, we can heat their homes while they're out during the day, so they're not flicking on the heating as soon as they come home in the evening. We've, we've built that assumption in. We realise that it's going to take quite a long time, but there's also the thought process that if with electric vehicles, it's kind of a nice way into that consumer engagement thought process that with an electric vehicle, if you've got that now and that's likely to happen over the next 10 years, there's going to be more and more electric vehicles. Then they get the time of use tariffs so they can charge up overnight and they begin to consumers begin to get used to the idea of how this works and to see that it's not actually going to be detrimental to, to the way that they live at all. But yeah, it's 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 a difficult one. <laughs> Yeah, definitely plenty of challenges, plenty of moving parts as well to try and um, keep keep uh, abreast of and keep up, up to date with. Um, I'm going to ask a slightly different question. I mean, kind of linked to the, you know, how do we help kind of mitigate the risk of these large, uh, large kind of uh, large uncertainties and large decisions such as, as CCS? Um, and that's specifically what do you see as the main challenges for delivering carbon capture and storage in the UK? Um, but coming to Alex first for for that. Thanks, Hannah. 
Yeah, so I'm going to focus more on the, the sort of policy aspect of the challenge rather than may, maybe more the technical side and some of the other panelists might be able to pick up on that technical aspect. Um, in my intro, I, I sort of mentioned that C was going to be the future counterparty, was the preferred name, preferred counterparty for the carbon capture and storage and the uh, power projects of so the DPA contract that's been developed and industrial CCS. Um, and I think it's fair to say that, you know, from my involvement uh, in, in the development of those schemes, uh, that there is a lot of, of government support for, for, for these schemes and a lot of, um, a lot of work being done. And, and to some extent, I think that officials are working really as fast as they possibly can to de deliver sort of uh, first of a kind sort of schemes uh, to support sort of technology and, and the deployment of the first clusters. Uh, and um, and and I and I'm pretty confident that you know providing the industry can deliver uh, on on the projects will have a policy framework that will support uh, you know the initial investments in this space. And so I, I'm I think the main challenge here is is not going to be the sort of first of a kind first of a kind deployment in terms of the policy framework, but it's going to be what comes next. And actually, that becomes really really difficult because. By having all these interventions, we're also creating additional complexity that we're layering on to this already complex system. And then um, there's going to be a real need to try and kind of bring these things together uh, if we're going to deliver cost effectively across the system. And, and, and so I think the UKI policy framework, which is something that, that officials need to start thinking about relatively soon, is really going to be the, 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 the crux and, and where the intervention around CCS will actually be successful or not. Um, I think I, 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 th I think about this more of a, a marathon rather than a sort of short term, um, short term sort of, of thing. So I think that's where my my focus is going forward, and it's about how do we make sure these 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 interventions uh, come together and become a coherent set of interventions going forward. And I think that's that, that would be my. Thank you. I mean, yeah, thanks, Alex. It's a really, yeah, really interesting point. I think we were so focused on that kind of getting that first one done that we're not necessarily always like looking what happens, what happens next, what happens when we're building the third or fourth, um, fourth one. Um, I wanted to bring Nathan in on on that question as well around the, the challenges of deploying um, carbon capture and storage in the UK and, and get your perspective on that. Yeah, thanks. And uh, again, I agree with with everything that Alex has, has said. There. I do think it's worth it's worth dwelling that dwelling the fact that delivering CCS is is, is probably and emphasis on the probably not too much of a technical challenge. Um, a lot of the parts of the technology are relatively mature now, and we are starting to see projects crop up around the world. That was a bit different 10 to 15 years ago when we really had few projects that we could look at, but we're starting to see uh, projects emerging um, right across the, across the globe now. So it largely, I think, is a policy challenge and a challenge of attracting the, the needed investment. And I would agree with everything that Alex said, but I do think it's worth underlining the pace here. You know. If you look at the climate change committee scenarios, they're requiring CCS for industrial processes, for hydrogen generation, for, for its role in the power sector, for, for negative emissions. This is a really key technology, and we're going to need to potentially deliver a lot of it in a pretty short space of time. So if it's a if it's a marathon, it is a marathon. We have to run pretty swiftly. Um, but I do think you know, let's focus on the positives as well. We've now got some pretty serious targets from from government, pretty clear hard targets for what they're going to deliver. And as Alex said, you know, a wealth of detailed consultation documents uh, coming out of, of government setting out their, you know, uh, dispatchable power agreement, their industrial carbon capture contracts, how, how, how TNS is going to be regulated and so on. So I think there's been really great progress made in this space. But I would just underline, as I've done with, with many of the other challenges, that pace is really critical here and we need to need to keep the, the momentum up on this. Thanks. Thanks, Nathan. I think, Steve, you wanted to um, kind of add to that, that point that Nathan's made as well. Yeah, no, thanks. Yeah, and and uh, agree with the point. I, I, I think CCS is, is, is going to be hugely important for us, not just in power actually, but also in hydrogen and in industry. And a couple of things just to add. Uh, I, yeah, in terms of the the technical challenge. Um, yeah, again, a lot of work happening on that. I think it's really important we get one built. Um, just to see, um, you know, we've got at the moment we've only got cost estimates. Really, we've only got. Um, yeah, estimates of the capture rates that we'll be able to achieve. We've only got estimates as to whether we'll be able to operate. Yeah, you know, how flexible, how flexibly we'll, 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 we can operate them. So I think this this um, effort to actually get one built that that's when we'll really really learn 
Um, uh, yeah, yeah, and, and it'll be vital, vital for the future. Um, just a couple of other challenges, just to mention. I think we've got to think about how we deal with the full life cycle carbon emissions. Um, yeah, when we mo do this, this, these modelling, we, we tend not to take account of the life cycle carbon, carbon emissions either of, of wind or nuclear or whatever, but they're they're, they're quite small. But with, with CCS, the full life cycle carbon emissions of, uh, associated with upstream gas are not small. Um, so we've got to think about that that as a, a, as, a, as a challenge. And then um, the, the other point, I, I guess, all the work that needs to be done on the regulatory and, and um, licensing structures, um, yeah, again, you know, you know and, uh, yeah, and long-term liabilities and all that sort of stuff. And again, all this stuff will, 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 will happen as we yeah, bring, bring the real project forward. So I think all that work that's happening to bring yeah, the first um, forward is, is really, really important. Great, thanks, Steve. I think yeah, that's a uh, important point. Point we often often miss is taking that that kind of whole whole life cycle analysis um, uh, approach to to assessing the carbon impact of different technologies. So yeah, really really um, great point to include. Thank you. Um, we have got maybe time for very kind of kind of almost like a quick fire question. Um, before we wrap up today's session so i know we've had some comments from uh from the audience and many thanks for for putting those into the um the q a there are a couple of questions relating to sort of like what can consumers do and what does this mean for um for organizations and i know we've touched on it a little bit um a little bit more uh, sorry a little bit in the the previous questions but i just wanted to kind of consolidate that and and ask what's the kind of role for, for behavior change where do we see that behavior change um being needed um in order to kind of help deliver a, a net zero uh, net zero energy system um i think becky you, you touched on this a bit um but previously so maybe i'll just come to uh come to you first um just for your kind of a very quick thoughts on, on that one okay i'll try and be quick um in, in FAIRS, we've got this as one of the one of the axes, consumer engagement. And it's safe to say that for the three net zero scenarios, all scenarios are along on the consumer engagement um, axes. We expect a level of consumer engagement and consumer change in every single scenario in order to get to net zero. Um, for in the consumer transformation and leading the way, it's really important. There's a lot about lifestyle change and also about um, your travel and transport choices and what you do in your home and that's where the sort of heat pumps are more prevalent but even in the system transformation scenario which is more about hydrogen heating we need the homes to be to be retrofitted and run more energy efficiently because we think that hydrogen is probably going to be more expensive than natural gas and people want to keep we'll need to keep the, the costs down for that. Um, we also did our own FES costing um, last year for the first time. We don't normally do the costs of the different scenarios, but last year we ran an actual costing exercise. And then within that, leading the way, the one with the highest level of consumer engagement had the lowest overall costs again. So that shows that consumer engagement can help it be cheaper in the end for everyone. So short, short answer. <laughs> Brilliant, thanks. Thanks, Becky. Um, I think we've maybe got time for one other person to comment on that question. I think, Nathan, did you want to add anything on that point? I can come in really quickly. So yeah, role of behaviour change in all of this, very significant as everyone's already talked about. I think it's worth uh, parsing it into two buckets. Behaviour change in, term, in a sort of enduring framework, you need to interact with the energy technologies in different ways, heat pumps, electric vehicles and so on, but also behaviour change to actually get that stuff into the home as Steve was talking about most of this technology isn't in people's homes right now. And we know that that's a challenge and that needs to be overcome as well. So behavior change to get technology in and then behavior change to actually interact with it once it's there in a different way. Thanks. Brilliant, thanks Nathan. And, and yeah, a good uh, point to end our session. I'm sure we could have talked um, on a number of different topics for a lot longer um, than we than we have available. Um, but uh, I just wanted to kind of wrap up up there and say thank you very much to all of our panelists for joining us today. And thank you to the audience for, for listening. Um, and I will uh, hand back to Janet now to wrap up this morning's session. Thank you. Thanks very much, Hannah. And uh, thanks very much, panel, for a really, really interesting session. I think it was uh, very worthwhile having uh, a reminder a couple of times so far this morning, actually, that the net zero target is not negotiable. We've got to get there. And so uh, um, it's also good to hear that uh, the importance of flexibility is pretty consistent. Um, it's a consistent view of, across all the organisations that we're talking this morning and, and all the work that we've seen. Um, so that, that that consistency certainly gives us something to work with. Obviously, we've still got uh, a long way to go to work out how best to value these technologies. Um, as Alex said during the discussion, valuing energy is relatively simple. Valuing avoidance or retiming 
use or carbon or stability um, is, is, is a lot more complex. And I think it's difficult, particularly for investors and users at a time now when the evolution is happening very quickly and it's not always obvious how long that, that uh, market is going, to, is going to remain stable and when it's going to move on to uh, the, next, the next stage of, of, of evolution. I think uh, we had some interesting points from uh, Nathan about the different types of technology we're seeing in the form of small consumer technologies instead of centralized assets. They may roll out very fast if they grab consumer enthusiasm, which can both solve problems and create it. Um, and uh, it's an interesting contrast with the discussion uh, of what's needed to look beyond first of a kind in rolling out CCS. Um, not just the technical issues, but uh, the non-technical issues that Steve brought up. And given the shift towards the distribution system that um, has, has been discussed, uh, I'm, I'm, and, and Becky's experience of tapping into those resources last year during the, the uh, days of maximum demand depression during the COVID uh, epidemic, um, it's it's really useful to think that we've got this the the flexibility in GB report um, before the distribution network operators finish their business plans for the next five years, and in advance of the new systems a smart system strategy we're expecting from Bayes. Um, and you're absolutely right, I think, to get onto the issues around um, how consumers are going to manage this. Um, and we certainly saw questions coming up in the chat about uh, the possibilities of data, the need to manage data, and um, the role of behaviour change, how people's behaviour is going to help this. And I'm very glad to say that we'll be looking at this in our next session on the role of smart technology. So do join us for that session at 2pm. And meanwhile, we'll encourage you to use the break to uh, explore all the content on the website that's available on demand. Just click on the resources tab and you'll be able to look at uh, the flexibility in Great Britain project at the report and at some other zero energy transition resources. Thanks very much for your attention and I look forward to seeing you at two o'clock.